Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Feeding Grain Podcast, and thank you for listening. My name is Stephen Kilger, Managing Editor of Feeding Grain and your host. We have a fantastic show for you today. Greg Franzen, Agri-Food Sector Lead at Faithful and Gold, and Mark Herbert, Project Controls Manager at Faithful and Gold, stop by to talk about what grain handlers and feed manufacturers should really do when they are starting a new construction project or working their way through a construction project to kind of protect themselves and make sure they are getting the most for their money. Uh, it's a big topic, and there's a lot of great information on when you should help, what to prepare for, and keep track of during a construction project, plus a ton more. It was really fun to talk with Greg and Mark. They're great guys, and I hope you enjoy listening. But before we do that, I've got a bit of housekeeping. If you're listening to this podcast within a podcast app, please consider subscribing. If you have an idea for a topic you would like me to cover, or someone in the animal feed, grain handling, or related industries that you think would be a great guest, let me know. Uh, this podcast page on feedinggrain.com has a button right under the title that will let you send me an email directly where you can share your ideas. And I, I really hope to hear from you soon. I'd really love to hear everyone's ideas. All right, on to our talk with Greg and Mark. You mentioned earlier about part of your project charter was to go through and have an idea, a general kind of idea of what risks might come up during the project, what things might happen, and then putting some kind of price on those or ability to move within your budget to address them, right? So what are some of the items to consider when you're you're brainstorming the the costs of a given risks and those risks overall? You know, all the planning in the world and great design and engineering and and planning can go a long ways to eliminate many risks. However, we do not live in a perfect world and everyone knows that. And so it's important to typically most most clients will recognize that those risks and create a contingency line item budget line item in their overall budget so that there's funding available to cover cost risks however some of the cost risks may be known when you're going into the project but some are not and so the idea behind managing cost risk is to work with the engineer, work with the contractor, and develop a risk log. What is it that's out there that potentially is at risk? Is there cost escalation on certain pieces of equipment because it wasn't ordered on time? Is that, you know, flooding's kind of a big subject this time of year in, in some parts of the Central U.S. with the river rising and all of that and how that might affect a project. or So there's all sorts of things like that. And so it's a matter of just capturing them, documenting them, putting them in a simple spreadsheet and calling them what they are and what the risk of the project is. Is there a schedule delay? Is it a cost issue? And then what would, might that cost? Is it $100,000, a million dollars? And then, you know, what's the likelihood or probability of it happening? And so you can make it as complicated as you want, but it seems to me that it's best to keep it simple. But what's more important is to work with the entire team because don't do it in isolation because you as a client, you're not aware of everything. And so involving the engineer, involving the architect, involving the contractor, and meeting regularly to address these items and then using that risk log to help inform how you're going to spend, you may spend part of your construction contingency. And so it all sort of works together. And so doing that, you're taking a proactive, you're being proactive. You're trying to come to a, you always want to, as a, as a project manager, a cost manager, you always want to be able to forecast what the, the whole project's going to cost at completion. And so the cost risk log will help you do that because it'll help give you visibility to what you maybe can't see all on your own. Yeah, Greg made a very good point. Don't overthink it. You can go into some pretty deep weeds with this stuff on probability, but keep it simple, cater to the audience. I mean, the, the key there, like Greg said, is you're not an island. So if the entire group is satisfied with the approach, then that's the approach. Don't overthink it. One thing that needs to be considered, though, is the sum total of these risks. You know, you look at a few and you treat them as bee stings and everything's fine. But 
when you step back and look at all of them, all of a sudden there's a thousand bees standing. So you got to think maybe this project shouldn't move forward because of this, or we approach it from a different direction, a different approach, something to that effect. So don't forget the big picture and accounting for risk because the risk exercise is important in going through each one. But then a lot of times what we miss is the idea of what is the impact of all of this, not just one or two and chasing them here and there, but taking it as a whole and how we consider that. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that executives and board members, they, no one likes surprises. Finding out their, that their project's going to be over budget. And so keeping track of risks are, is a way to keep the team, all project stakeholders, informed about what could potentially come up. I mean, no one likes to pay more than they have to for a project, but what they like less than that is to be surprised by a cost overrun. If people are informed all the way along the path of the project, people can address it and and deal with it in a proactive way instead of being surprised. And so the risk log really can help with that. I mean, imagine what, well, we all know what happened. We all have our experience with what happened with project costs during the pandemic and during the subsequent cost escalation hockey stick that kind of followed, a lot of projects went way over budget because of the cost escalation. And and so it's important to stay on top of it. And so, you know, who knows how right now, I think we're running five to seven percent in construction cost escalation. And where's that going? What are the trends? Is there, what do we think is going to happen? And so that all. Yeah, it's that old saying, hope for the best, plan for the worst. It's better to to know and not be surprised. And that's really what a lot of the project charter and things are, right? It's about documenting and all these things come down to the same thing, which is mitigating the chance of a, a big surprise coming and derailing the entire project. At least that's what it means to me. <laughs> What advice do you have for clients and contractors on effectively managing project costs uh, throughout the lifestyle? Because uh, as we know, things can get out of whack pretty quick. So effectively managing costs. Well, <clears throat> Mark, I'll maybe let you jump in and, and take this one. But... Uh, Obviously, the first step is to have a, a good budget that's based on um, good, solid information. And so sometimes what clients do is that they'll, they'll go out to contractors and get, and get pricing, get, get bids, and they'll, they'll assemble it, and then they'll just add X percent for a contingency. Well, I mean, that's one way to do it. Um, but if it, whatever, we're, of course, we're consultants, so we're, we're big believers in having an independent third party at least do a cost estimate validation of what, of what the client has pulled together for a budget, just because, you know, so early on, if you're having contractors do budget pricing, that may be accurate, but but there may be some gaps into it. So that's why having that independent third party um, do a, a cost estimate validation will, will give the client confidence that, hey, it's, you know, we've had this contractor provide an estimate or we got this, we did this estimate in-house. Having a third party validate it, look for holes, gaps. Um, so starting out, with a, a proper budget is step number one to um, you know managing managing costs. You you want to make sure that your <clears throat> that your foundation is solid, and then you know as we talked about a few minutes ago with managing cost risk, just staying on top of. Um, the potential change order items and risks and addressing them addressing them in a timely fashion so that the contractor is able to keep going and 
there aren't, there aren't delays. So just good project, good uh, having a good project routine is a good way to um, start. Yeah, and we so a lot of times also the the budget is is the foundation, and so I see a lot of clients they'll get pressured, unfortunately, and or I'll get pressured, or someone else who's planning this will get pressured to lower prices. Um, upper management obviously doesn't want to spend money if they don't have to, and so unfortunately, we see sometimes the call down says make it x percentage less or make this less cost or you know why is this so expensive what and and so that unfortunately what happens is, is we start driving down prices when we don't fully know why it's just because someone's request is in and that, that's a that's a delicate situation because you have to walk through the politics of it um and Yes, they are right, but they're also wrong. Uh, we need to be educated on what costs we're assigning. We don't get a range of estimates and just grab the lowest one. Um, we can grab the lowest one if it's validated and we understand why. So, so that, unfortunately, I see that quite a bit. Uh, money runs out because the plan was wrong to begin with. It was based on assumptions and almost a fear, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, so, so having that that unbiased approach from the get go, just as a philosophy, will help guide this project to success um, throughout. And then, it, it, yeah, that's the foundation. And then working through it, you you make a plan, you work the plan, and then you change the plan, and then you work a new plan because change is constant. And so you have to be able to roll with it. And and a lot of times, a whole other podcast could be dedicated to um, databasing structures to allow for this, where we talk about hierarchies versus relational databases. And I won't get into that. Your audience will probably thank you. And yeah, you, you are, you, I'm sure you probably you won't get too many people attending that one. Um, <laughs> but that idea of catering from the get-go, how you're doing your documentation, how you're doing your cost management, it's a philosophy approach so that you can infinitely expand and roll with change for the rest of your project. Because a lot of times that's where they trip up too, because people look at a system and go, eh, this is the way we've done it and this is the way we're going to keep doing it because I don't know how to change. Well, we need to create the attitude being the systems need to be ready to easily accept change from the get-go so that doesn't happen. Well, that would, I mean, that leads into a whole other subject of, you know, that the whole change management process. Sometimes what happens is that, you know, there'll be a, a corporate capital project at a, at a processing plant and, you know, it'll be designed and there'll be a, an estimate. But then pretty soon the plant has all these things that they, changes they want to make and, you know, maybe for good reason um, and maybe a ton of benefit, but at the end, you know, what ends up happening is that the scope of the project changes, so the cost changes, the schedule may change. And so, um, you know, having a good change management process and is, is in good decision management and good project management is, uh, is really needed to keep. Yeah, that, it, it's a really good point that all of this, uh, everything we kind of talked about so far is really about giving people flexibility to make changes, right? Because uh, a lot of people might say like, oh, well, you know, now that we have the, the project charter, this is what we're going to stick to. But that's not really the idea, right? The idea is like, oh, we have this and we have flexibility in it so that when we find out later that you know the mississippi river is going to flood, <laughs> flood this year we can make those changes and those adapt it without losing everything <laughs> so uh, uh last question for you for today at least uh i i have a i have a theory you guys are going to be coming back at some point <laughs> Uh, what what are your most critical issues for owners and contracts to discuss uh, before they sign a project, uh, before they sign a contract for a project? So we have a <clears throat> we have a pretty good list here. Uh, we'll talk about a few of them. Um, it you know it, well. 
I mean, it starts with form of contract. You know, contracts are contracts are important because they're obviously a legal document that informs the contractor and informs the client and the engineer how what we're going to agree to and and how it's going to be done. And so, uh, for instance, if there's a guaranteed maximum price at GMP to a, a contract. You know, as as the client, you want to make sure you have a complete understanding of you know the the full buildup of the GMP budget. And again, I'm going to just make a plug for an independent third party estimate to validate the contractor's budget to understand you know what are the gaps, if there are allowances built in, how are they built up. If there are contingencies, how are the contingencies to be used? Are they, is the contingency the contractors to use exclusively? Or is it a shared use? All of those sorts of details are important. important. And so, um, you know, if the contractor is doing self perform work uh, where they're not, the contractor's not, for instance, let's say it's concrete. And so they won't be bidding that scope of work out. And so what, as an owner, what's your, you need to have a basis of comparison. So that's where I, I think an uh, uh, independent third-party estimate of that contractor self-perform work is just a requirement. So you, as, a, as an owner, have a basis of comparison. And so you really understand what, what you're buying. So Mark has done a really good job uh, with understanding cost and schedule reporting requirements uh, o over the years. Mark is Mark is a pro project controls manager and deals with cost management and and schedule management. And so he he knows what's necessary to uh, from a reporting standpoint to understand you know that the relative health of the project. And so um, one of the things that is important to include in any contract with a contractor is to spell out what are the reporting requirements that you as an owner expect. I want a, we need a critical path method schedule. Um, on a monthly basis, we need a three week look ahead on a you know, weekly basis. So listing out all of those schedule reports and cost reports, we want a cash flow uh, report, and we need the cash flow report uh, monthly. Uh, so Mark, feel free to jump in. And well, a lot of the you know critical issues. Uh, another big one is how is the contractor going to manage the contract because again the owner it's their money right so they have every right to understand what's happening with their money so if the contractor says yeah we'll build it for you i i wouldn't feel comfortable with that um you know talking with them on hey are you going to plan this and actually build a schedule are you going to use management tech what kind of management techniques are you going to use is this going to be daily stand down meetings during the you know the the concrete structural process of this and then we switch over to sort of a last planner approach with planning boards on site for the mechanical trades that come in and overlap each other. And then we switch to lean and just in time techniques for um, arrivals and de of deliveries and, and, and understanding how the management is going to be going into this will set this up for success because it, these are processes that just work. They're plans. They work plans, and then one day the project's done and everybody's happy. But without knowing how you're going to manage this, all of a sudden it's the go time, and people stand around looking at each other, going, uh, "What do we do now?" You know, we're supposed to be doing things. What you know? So, so that that's that's critical. Understanding how they're going to manage the project, not only just the project, but the different phases that the project's going to be in through its life cycle. Um, and another good one that a lot of people don't think of, and this is like a bonus, is going to be more risk sharing. And this is a tough one because in the construction industry, it's a pretty macho industry. So telling these people that, hey, we're going to get um, 
you know, we're, we're going to be partners here. They, they don't, a lot of people don't like that idea. They're like, we want to push all the risk off on somebody else. We just don't want risk. Well, that, that might not be the best approach. And so talking with these contractors and weighing out the risks and opportunities and sharing these is actually proving in my experience to be very productive and, and a win-win for everybody. Because if it's a lose for somebody and a win for somebody else, then the person that won is still going to lose because they're, they're fighting the. Thank you. Thank you for that bonus. <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's, that's great advice. Uh, and those are all the questions I have. Uh, and like I said, I, I think we just are scratching the surface of this topic. So I really do hope you guys uh, come back again. But for now, is there anything uh, you think I've missed? Anything you want to add? Uh, add? Uh, also, I will also put out there, yes, people, get uh, get consultants. Uh, <laughs> they get a bad rap from TV, but I've only found them to be very nice, pleasant people who want to uh, give you an expertise that you probably don't have just sitting around on your own payroll. So uh, I think what you guys do is great. Uh, any other, uh, anything else you want to tell our audience? Um, <clears throat> I think the only thing that um, that comes to mind right now is that we're, we happen to be working with a client uh, right now uh, and they're negotiating with a contractor for, for a scope of work and having, for an owner to have a, a, a consultant uh, in, in their corner advising them I, I, has been really helpful. And um, just from a, if nothing else, from a coaching standpoint, but we all need input and we all need an advisor or someone to, you know, speak into our lives to help us, you know, grow and develop as people. And so having, having someone, whether that's someone from, you know, the, the company that's there to advise and support or having that consultant that has, has the experience is just, uh, I think a real confidence booster to a project team to, you know, to have a, have someone to, uh, go to and and affirm or provide other options, ideas for for consideration. So uh, no no one likes to do do it alone, really. So we all we all need support from from uh, from others that have experience. Um. All right. Well, thank you again so much for talking to me, uh, Greg, Mark. Uh, it was a real pleasure. Uh, I hope you had a good time. And for everyone else out there listening right now, uh, make sure you stay safe and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks.